Thanks very much, Peter, and thanks everybody for uh, having me here. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, some of you have probably seen me. This is a stump speech that we've been making for about a year now um, about the IIJA. So I apologize if a little bit of this is repetitive. I will talk a little bit about Texas, but I, I really want to talk about the transformational nature of the IIJA and what it's going to do for us. I know the FRA is going to be speaking after me, and I apologize if a lot of um, what we both say is going to be a little bit repetitive, but I do want to talk about the IIJA. I will just say, usually when I'm introduced, uh, and I was introduced by a member of Congress in January, and, and that member, who shall remain nameless, introduced me as saying, Amtrak just got $66 billion. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't correct him, because you don't do that to a member of Congress, but we did not get $66 billion. The mode of transportation got $66 billion. But if we can, let's see, I guess, there we go. So um, the IIJA did provide $66 billion for this mode of transportation. I'm in these slides and I talk about how that breaks up. But what's really important about it is that um, in Amtrak's 51-year history now, we've received about $65 billion in capital um, or in funding to keep the railroad operating since 1971. So this, this infusion of capital for the mode in total over five years is more than we've gotten in our entire history. Uh, and it's really, it comes, as you see in this box here on the right, um, my right, it comes in, in, three, in three main boxes. It comes 22 billion directly to us, 36 billion to the FRA, four um, inner city passenger rail, and eight billion for rail safety. I'm the vice president of the state support service line at Amtrak. And, and if you know a lot about Amtrak, and I assume this is a pretty um, sophisticated audience when you talk about passenger rail. Amtrak does three different things. We run the Northeast Corridor, and we saw some great presentations from some of our suppliers um, about the Northeast Corridor. We run the high-speed electric train sets between Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C. We run a series of overnight long-distance trains around the country. That's our long-distance service line. And then, of course, we run our short-distance service line, what we refer to as the state-supported service line. Uh, that's what I run. Um, Pre-pandemic, that service line accounted for 50% of our, our ridership. So about ha one out of, out of every two passengers on an Amtrak train rides one of the, the state-supported service line trains. It's the fastest growing part of the company, and it's really what we're going to talk about today because the IIJA is really geared, I think, a lot towards helping us grow state-supported services around the country. The law that governs us, the PREA law, which uh, was passed 12, 14 years ago, um, had, a, had a provision in it, a governing provision, which basically says that all short distance trains in the United States, and short, short distance is defined as 750 miles or less, but all short distance trains in the country have to be funded by a state or a non-Amtrak entity. So um, that's a very dynamic law, and it basically says we cannot start trains, short distance trains on key corridors without a partnership with a state, MPO, you know, an entity like that. There's the map. This is what my service line looks like. The dark blue lines are the state-supported services around the country. We have 17 uh, state partners, and together they run 28 routes um, around the country. It's actually 20 partners, but California has, we have four different contracts with California. So 17 states, 20 partners, 28 routes. You've all seen maps like this, and I won't dwell too much on this, but um, I'm going to talk about our strategy for reauthorization and, and why this is important. These are what the mega regions in the country look like. These are often called heat maps. I think you've all seen them. This is really where the, the population centers of the United States are. And this is what the Amtrak route map looks like with the, the population centers. And what you'll notice when you look at that um, is that we don't do a very good job of, of hitting the major population centers in the United States, especially where the population is moving to. You know, we skip, we don't hit Columbus, Ohio, we don't hit Nashville, Tennessee, Louisville, Kentucky, um, Wichita, Kansas, we don't serve Las Vegas, we really don't serve Phoenix. Um, in here in Texas, we have very limited service. Houston, the fourth largest city in the country, we have tri-weekly service. Atlanta, we have one daily train, kind of in the middle of the night. Um, point is that uh, our network hasn't changed much in 51 years, and we looked at reauthorization as an opportunity to change that. Peter talked about our vision. We call it Amtrak Connects Us. <clears throat> and um, so we went into reauthorization knowing that we had an opportunity to really um, transform uh, passenger railroading in the United States and really grow the Amtrak system. We, we had a 
very bold, ambitious vision to, to get $5 billion a year in capital um, for quarter development over five years. We, we were asking for $25 billion. Um, the infrastructure bill uh, came up with $66 billion, so in many respects we succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. It didn't, certainly does not go to Amtrak. A lot of it goes to the FRA. But um, the certain, we, we seem to have struck a nerve, and I, you know, I was in government affairs at the time when we created this vision, and, and I think um, it really um, motivated people. When we went into that, we really went into it knowing that we were asking for billions to develop corridors in partnership with states around the country, and we had to show the Congress what you know we could do if we got 25 billion over five years, five billion a year for quarter development. And so we came up with this vision. We looked at what did we want the Amtrak network to look like? Where did we want to go? And it's those cities, it's those city pairs that I just talked about. You know, it's developing and expanding existing corridors. It's growing into new markets here in Texas. We have very limited service here. We have very limited service in Florida. The population is moving here. Uh, we wanted to grow the network, serve Las Vegas, serve Phoenix, serve the Front Range in Colorado, grow service to Atlanta, you know, hit Louisville, Nashville, Columbus, um, all of those cities we don't serve. This is really what we wanted to do. And so we laid it out. <clears throat> we went around knocking on doors for the state DOTs and say, this is what we're promoting. Will you support us in reauthorization? I will say we think we did a pretty good job, although it probably helped to have a guy named Amtrak Joe in the White House <clears throat> when the bill passed. And um, so, but uh, it's all very good news. This is the slide I want to spend the most time on for you all this morning because this really breaks it down. So this, these are some boxes that show how the, how the capital funding that's in the IIJA break out. <clears throat> the boxes on the right are dollars which go directly to Amtrak, the, um, or for, I'm sorry, for the national network. <clears throat> the, the boxes on the left are for the Northeast Corridor. <clears throat> they go to the Northeast Corridor. The ones surrounded in green, um, the boxes in green, so the ones really at the bottom and in the middle, go to the FRA. <clears throat> Those dollars go to the FRA. The ones surrounded in blue go directly to Amtrak. So you can see the 22 billion for Amtrak and you can see the 36 billion for the FRA for, for passenger rail and then the eight billion in the middle really for safety and, and grants, <clears throat> um, which is wonderful. Uh, I have 27 years here at the company. Usually when there was ever a big infusion of capital, <clears throat> that box on the right-hand side, the national network was very small and the boxes for the corridor were a little bigger. So this is a really transformational bill. And it's the box in the bottom right-hand corner that I wanna spend most of the time talking about. <clears throat> um, it's called the Federal State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail. <clears throat> and this is the Amtrak Connexus box. <clears throat> um, this is, these are dollars which go to the Federal Railroad Administration. And these are dollars which the FRA will use to help states grow corridor services, sort of in line with the vision around the country. What those corridor services look like is up to the states, the FRA, and, and the stakeholders. It really is. Our vision, there's, there is nothing carved in stone about our vision. It's not a legally defined. We didn't have legally defined corridors, you know, as a result of that. It was just a vision for what it could look like. And it was really meant to get this, you know, this box um, for corridor development. So $12 billion is going to go to the Federal Railroad Administration to basically work with states to invest in corridors to start new short distance services all over the country. Um, this is a little wordy, a little bit detailed here, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about um, how those dollars will be spent and, and, and how, and uh, the, the next slides will make sense to you, but um, the Federal State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail Grants, 12 billion over five years to the FRA. And then the R&E grants, so back in that that box, and I apologize, maybe I can go back to this slide. This box in the top right, the 16 billion for Amtrak. The R&E grants, the restoration and enhancement grants, um, are operating grants, those are operating dollars. So states can get transitional operating support to pay the first six years, a portion of the first six years of operating costs for new services. That's gonna come as a drawdown from that box that I showed you before, the 16 billion from, for Amtrak's national network. So there is money in our network grant which is going to go or be available to states to uh, provide transitional operating support for new services. The Interstate Rail Compact Grant, this is a new program. Um, one of the visionary things about the infrastructure bill is it, it, it foresaw the need for states to get together to start regional services. Most of our state supported services generally are funded by you know, one state. We have a few multi-state contracts but they're helping states fill their transportation need. The IIJA said, let's look at regional services um, in a different way than we have before, S services that cross state lines. And it created this, this pot of money, the Interstate Passenger Rail Compact grants, 
to allow states to get together, form interstate compacts, hire staff, pay staff, uh, to work on developing regional services. It's a very um, forward-thinking, transformational little program in there. You see that I think it's 15 million over five years, so about three million a year to, um, for states to start interstate compacts. And then, of course, um, our national network grant um, is above and beyond uh, what's in the IIJ. We should be authorized about two billion a year. So I don't want to steal the FRA's thunder here, but um, this is what the corridor identif identification program is going to look like. And I, and I don't know, Allison, where are you? Um, where's Allison? Oh, she's going to speak, but because um, um, I think she comes next, uh, or two speakers after me. But essentially what's going to happen is the FRA is going to stand up a program. And they're going to be seeking states to submit applications for service development plans for, for corridors or the visions for the corridors. And then they'll rate them essentially and begin to reward money based on um, grant applications on the quarters that have been submitted. This is what it will look like. This is a better way to look at it. Um, the FRA is going to create the corridor program. They have to stand it up by May 14th of this year. Um, and then uh, there'll be you know, a quarter selection process. States, regions, entities will be submitting uh, proposals to the FRA for these new corridors around the country, whether it be Dallas to Houston or, you know, Fort Worth to Oklahoma City to Wichita to Newton, whatever the states want to submit, you know, whatever vision they want to submit, they'll submit to the FRA. Um, the FRA will work with them on a service development plan, think of the planning document for these new, for these new routes. And then um, next year in May, May 14th of 2022 is when they stand up the program, May 14th of 2023 is when they submit their vision for these corridors to the Congress. <clears throat> it's important for states, for the, and this is a largely an advocacy community here, it's important, it's very important that states that want to develop corridor services submit their proposal, their vision to the FRA, you know, after May of this year. Um, so they can get on that map in May of 2023. I will tell you that, you know, we spent a lot of time talking to the FRA planning staff on this. Um, that's the day the door opens, it's not the day the door closes, May of 2023. They look, they want this program to be permanent, but you know, the earlier you're on that list, the better. We have lots of ways we can help, um, and we do wanna help the states do this. This is the timeline of what it looks like. Um, the, I, what I wanna show you on this slide, and, and this is getting long, so I'm gonna go through the next ones pretty quickly, but these are how the funds are gonna be released. We're not yet at the, the top line, the purple line, that comes May 14th of, of 2022. That's when this timeline starts. And you'll see there's um, 12 months in there for states to submit their proposals for quarter services. And then May 14th of 2023 is when the, the funds begin to be expended or awarded uh, by the FRA. The inner, city, the inner city rail compact grants, they can already start doing that. And our, our set asides in, in the network grant start next May as well. Somebody's got the president on there? It's not my phone, is it? <laughs> so, so I didn't want to pay $50. <laughs> I'm going to skip the, the next couple of slides here in the interest of time. I do want to focus on this one, the operating grants. You see the box in the top-hand corner on the right-hand side. The R&E program stands for Restoration Enhancement Grant Program. These are operating dollars available to states um, or entities that start quarter service to help them cover the operating cost over a six year period. You see 90, 80, 70, 60 phases out and then in year seven, section 209 of the PREA law takes effect so states start paying the, the, full, the, the full cost of their services. This comes out of the Amtrak National Network Grant. We're very proud of this. I think the challenge for states historically for starting new services is that the price of admission has been really high. Um, we have great operating rights to access the railroads around the country to provide inner city passenger service, but the railroads can and do require significant capital investments to be made in their infrastructure before services can, can begin operating. Those barriers or those costs can, uh, can serve as barriers and can be in some cases hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to start new services. This program, the IIJ, the capital in there, is really meant to help states um, initiate the services. And then this, this program I'm talking about here, the operating side, really helps them grow those services, give, allows them to get a foothold over six years and then transition into part of the state's transportation program. 
Um, Peter, I, I, please feel free to send this, this PowerPoint out to anybody who requests it. Just if you can, just put it in a PDF. This is a, this is a PowerPoint. There's a lot of detail in here. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip some of these slides. Um, the next few slides are really about sort of the things we can help states do, but I want to skip right to the end of the, the deck here and talk about this slide. This is really what we can do for states, and this is how it's going to really work. If you have a vision for a quarter service, we'll say, you know, Dallas to Houston, lay out your vision, cut, and excuse me, then come up with a development plan for that. You know, talk about what kind of frequencies are you looking at, where you're looking at station stops. Um, what kind of speeds do you want to have? Lay out your development plan, submit it to the FRA. Do a service plan and a financial evaluation based on that development plan. And a service plan is, you know, what are your crew turns going to look like? What kind of equipment do you want? High level, you know, single level, that kind of thing. You know, again, what kind of, what kind of turns do you want at the end, you know, based on the frequencies that, that you, you're looking at? And then um, use that to come up with a final service plan. If you've, if you've got the service plan and the financial evaluation and it shows whatever your, your operating support is going to be needed, and you bring it to your state legislature, say, okay, we've got support for this. We'll go straight to the final service plan and then we'll implement it. We'll get really hard, take really hard look at looking at staffing needs, equipment needs, maintenance needs for that equipment, infrastructure costs for the, for the railroad. We'll do all of that in partnership. We can do it or the state can do it, but we can really help states do it. And then you do the final financial plan based on the, the final service plan. Then you go to implementation, you apply for grants. <clears throat> Hopefully you'll be successful. It's 12 billion over five years. We, the FRA, I think the Congress wants this program to become permanent. So billions a year for states to develop corridors. You know, continue to apply for these dollars. You don't have to apply for them all at once. You can apply for them spaced over time. And, and then we go to implementation. I covered a lot of ground there. Again, Peter, please feel free to send this presentation out to anybody who wants to look at it. Um, there's, uh, I, these are really, this is very transformational um, in, our, in our history, uh, this, this grant program. I'll go back to my favorite slide. I spend a lot of time on this. But um, when you think about this slide, and think of, of how the money comes, um, we really have, we're, we're at a unique point in our history um, for passenger rail. We sometimes call it our Camelot moment <laughs> at Amtrak. Um, but, you know, we really have an opportunity here. And, and I think this group, you know, you have wonderful advocates and wonderful suppliers and consultants in this room who can really move these corridors forward. There's a lot of money to do it now. Um, the timing is right. The mood of the country is right. Um, and so I'm excited about it. I'm really honored that the company chose me to lead the service line at this time. I really do want to help states start new corridor services. I'd love that to be my legacy and my company's legacy uh, for the country. So, um, Peter, is we time for questions, or should I take questions on this? 